You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. To help make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're going to talk about emerging markets. What are they? What kind of economies are involved? Where are they going? You know, what what do we see happening here in the years ahead? Joining me today is Klaus DeVries, the Senior Economist at the Conference Board, joining me live from Holland. Klaus, welcome. Hi, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Klaus, you know, I think people hear this term emerging markets, you know, on the news or, you know, they read it in the newspaper. But, you know, tell us, what does it mean uh, generally? How do economists think about emerging markets? Yeah, that's a good point. I think we first need to have a good idea of what, what an emerging market exactly is uh, indeed. So, I think the best way to think of it is sort of, I mean, you have developing economies, you have developing, uh, sorry, developed economies and developing economies and emerging markets is really sort of a subgroup of this developing uh, economy. So they're a little bit in between. They're not very low in the developing stage, but they're also not considered uh, developed, so to say. Okay. So, so just, but just give us a couple of examples of developed markets, US, of course, other developed markets, Western Europe. Canada, UK, Australia, Japan, Western okay. Europe. Yeah, those are the okay. developed markets. And, and then an example of the emerging markets, which is sort of the high end of the developing markets. Yeah, so we'll we'll get to that in a second, maybe, but because there's you know many lists circulating about you know which countries are included, but I mean broadly, you should think about countries like uh, you know like China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, Turkey, Russia, those kind of economies. Those are the typical emerging market economies. Yeah, and so those are the ones with GDP per capita that is kind of approaching the levels of, you know, North America and Western Europe. And then there's the the bottom end, which we're not going to really get into today. But uh, those are the the poorer countries. And just give a few examples of those. Yeah, so a lot of those would be in sub-Saharan Africa. So countries like Ethiopia, uh, Ghana, Kenya, those kind of economies. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, but so we're going to talk about the emerging markets, which are the ones that are emerging from this developing list. So I'm just trying to get all the, all the lingo down. Yeah. Where does this, where does this label come from? Yeah, it's an interesting story, actually. So I think it uh, originated somewhere in the early 1980s. It was someone from the World Bank who came up with this term as a sort of, you know, an analytical framework to to sort of analyze uh, or set apart a, a set of countries. And I think that the label was really to uh, meant to evoke you know, a sense of progress, uplift, dynamism, uh, instead of the sort of the third world uh, label. Yeah, so that that's a little bit of the, the history in the 1980s. And an interesting thing is also, you know, the emerging economies that were considered emerging in the 1980s, some of them have emerged actually, sort of, so to speak, right, quote unquote, emerged and have entered sort of the developed category. So g- give some examples of, of those. I mean, that because 40 years ago, early 80s, 40 years ago, I mean, that's in a lifetime, it's a big chunk of uh, years. But, you know, in the context of developing nations, that's not so much time. So we've seen some some big movement here. Yeah, well, yeah, on the one hand, yes. I mean, there have been some countries like uh, like, like Korea is a good example, I think, South Korea uh, or, or Taiwan, uh, you know, some of these these Asia, so-called Asian tigers, also the city-states of uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. But overall, yeah, like you already say, I mean, it's not something that happens very rapidly. And, and most of the economies, I think, that were sort of emerging in the 1980s are still considered emerging in that sense. So it's in that sense, yeah, it's a slow moving process. Yeah. So you mentioned China on the list of of these emerging markets, but you know, you you have um, you, you you've talked about this before that China is not really one homogenous nation. There are lots there are lots of pieces, and it's so huge, you know. There, but there are some areas that are really developed, and some that are really undeveloped. Talk a little bit about that because that's such a big component. 
that's a good point and, and china is a bit of a special case i think because it's i mean it's so huge it's probably a, you know you should consider it as a as a as a class in itself so to say but on the other hand i mean some of the things that you point out like uh you know you have the cities on the on the eastern coast that are probably not very different in terms of income levels from uh you know from from western uh, european cities or, or u.s cities compared to the you know the huge countryside the rural parts of the country where incomes are much lower and i think that's also one of the characteristics of an emerging economy that you have these huge differences within the country whereas in developed economies like again like like in the us or or, or in western europe you have a much more equal sort of distribution across, you know, across the country, whether you live on the countryside or or in the big cities. I mean, income levels are relatively, uh, I mean, of course, they have regional inequalities, but broadly speaking, they're relatively, uh, uh, relatively equal. So the big drivers of these emerging markets are the so-called BRIC countries. You know, that was a term that was thrown about, you know, so, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that group. Yeah. So over time, they have been various of those kind of acronyms so BRIC was a very popular one uh, uh, meaning the Brazil uh, Russia India uh, China uh, group and uh, later it was uh, also South Africa was added so you had this BRICS group and 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 sometimes these groups you know they become uh, they even become formalized so you have you actually have a BRIC forum for example where these countries actually come together to discuss you know uh, common uh, things that are in common interest so this this BRIC group, I think it was in the early 2000s that it uh, came into existence when you had this very upsurge, very fast growth in, uh, well, in these BRIC economies, especially China, but also in Brazil and in India. And a lot of that was driven by the, uh, by the commodity boom. So if you remember oil prices, they were going very rapidly. Early 2000s, they reached uh, $100 per barrel uh, in the latter half of that decade. So that was really a time when, you know, the tide seemed to be very favorable to uh, to these emerging markets and, and you know, these acronyms uh, sort of popped up. Uh, yeah, and, and, and a lot of these emerging markets have natural resources that, uh, you know, and also cheap labor, but, but natural resources that have helped them talk about, you know, the characteristics here, which help that are helping lift these economies in total. Yeah, so well, not I mean, not not all of them. Uh, obviously, Brazil and and Russia are typical examples of of, of countries with large commodity exports, uh, but others like you know like China or India, I mean, they have much more uh, human resources, right? They have large large pools of labor, uh, large uh, especially in India, you have a lot of young people sort of entering uh, the labor market, and that can also be well. We'll get to that in. in later in the conversation maybe as well uh, but that is also you know a, a big driver of of their uh, uh, of their overall sort of sort of growth economic growth yeah you know as an economist you know you've been studying this you know your entire career but y- you are accountable at the conference board for doing these forecasts you know of, of all of these these various groups maybe you could just share with us the forecasts for the globe in total and then break it down into how much of that you know what of that is driven by the developing i'm sorry developed yet you have to be clear on these terms developed nations and then you know the developing nations because it's it's a it's an interesting they're they're different in terms of their growth rates yeah yeah so overall uh as as the term suggests i mean they, they are emerging they come from a lower base so overall they have you know they simply have much faster growth rates but yeah so yeah just to take a, uh, a brief step back so i every month we do a uh we do a short write up basically around you know some uh, some you know what what's going on in emerging markets uh, and and what are our forecasts so that's that's a monthly publication that uh, that we do and uh, and that's also part of as you mentioned our our global forecast so um, but just yeah just to take some numbers here so for for this year for 2022 our global growth for uh, estimate is at 3.3%. And our estimate is uh, that emerging and developing economies, we group them together, actually grow 3.8%. And uh, uh, sort of developed markets grow, or mature economies, we have different terms for them, they grow by 2.7%. So already in this year, you have you have a pretty big divergence, you know, in, in growth rates. Actually, maybe we'll get to that in a second in a bit more detail. But next year, we think that that 
growth differential is actually going to be much bigger, where we have uh, mature economies, uh, particularly the US, but also Europe growing at much lower rates. So they grow at 0.5%. That's our forecast for 2023 uh, versus uh, 3.5% for uh, emerging and, and developing economies. So, so you can see there, you know, overall they have been growing faster, but also for our forecast, we, we expect them to, to grow a lot faster than, than the developed economies. Yeah, and this is not surprising. I mean, if you're taking a developed or, as you know, the other term, as you said, is mature economies, by definition, a mature economy is not going to grow as fast as a as an emerging economy. The whole point of emerging is they're growing faster because they're catching up. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So the thing is, you have a difference between adding a growth rate and adding an absolute number, maybe from your business experience, you will know that, you know, if you have a low base, your growth rate is always going to be higher, right? Uh, but if you have a high base and you have a low growth rate, you can still add, you know, you still add a lot of, uh, a lot of absolute, in absolute terms, so to say. Yeah, I mean, a, a smaller percentage of a big number is, can be more than a large percentage of a small exactly. number. I mean, yeah, that's, that's important so, to keep in mind. Yeah. yeah, and that's what you're saying with the, but you know, it's interesting when you look at these emerging economies, it, it seems like 50 years ago, they were not emerging as fast and they weren't growing as fast. And it's, I, you know, I don't know if you've, if, if there's how much data there is behind this, but it seems as we have become more integrated as a global economy and as Western nations have begun to manufacture and move supply chains into these nations, you're seeing a lot more rapid growth um, than in the past when, when these nations were more isolated. Definitely. Yeah, no, I think that, and that's, Again, that's maybe also part of this emerging market categorization. One of the things is that they open up to uh, market-friendly reforms. So, you know, what's well known, for example, in, in the 90s, where we had India uh, opening up, you know, a lot of their uh, their markets to, to foreign capital. Uh, China was a little bit before that, at the end of the 70s. So, yeah, definitely, you know, this increasing integration, this increasing, uh, you know, uh, uh, liberating market reforms. I mean, that's that's been a big driver of, of this growth in emerging economies. Definitely. It helped them to sort of emerge. And, and the WTO is, you know, let, let's give some credit because that, that has that has driven a lot of it as people have as people countries have wanted to join the WTO, which is a common set of rules around trade, which then you know, it, it then puts us all sort of on an even playing field, right? I think that's had a big contribute, big yeah, contribution. Absolutely. Yeah. Globalization and yeah, trade integration. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, um, you know, you started, I, I asked you about the, the short term forecast. Uh, how about the longer term forecast? How do you see the differential between developed and these developing nations? So overall, I think the, the, I mean, the overall backdrop is we have a slowing global trend curve, right? Simply because the supply side is is weakening. You know, we have aging demographics across the world. We have uh, uh, productivity growth that's on a slowing trajectory. So, you know, you, I can go on a little bit, but overall, you know, as we have a weakening supply side, that is sort of weakening the the, the trend growth rates. And that's true for both developed and for developing economies. But overall, I think in the overall picture is that it's it's a bit less severe in uh, in emerging economies. And again, there's also a large variation within emerging economies. So, for example, the you know the slowing trend growth in in China, but also some other Asian economies, is largely driven by by uh, aging demographics, as as has been true, especially for Europe as well. And that has a sort of knock on effect on the growth in capital supply as well. So that's sort of driving their trend growth rate lower. Uh, but for others, it's, you know, it, it's much more uh, related to productivity growth, for example, uh, uh, Latin America, but also the Middle East. Uh, that's one of the factors that's driving their trend growth rate uh, uh, slower. But again, you know, taking that having been said, overall, our 10-year forecast still suggests that uh, despite this, emerging markets are still uh, outperforming the global economy. They are. Uh, we're expecting them to to contribute about eighty percent, actually, of the global growth rate of the next the next decade. That's up from you know about sixty seventy percent over the last decade. So yeah, so that's definitely a trend that we see we see increasing. 
We discussed the current state of emerging markets and how they are holding up. We'll come back after a short break and talk more about what's to come. As you and your company monitor the volatile and uncertain economy, the award-winning forecast team at the Conference Board predicts a downturn by the end of 2022. Recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended expectations, from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, and as the Conference Board has always done, we are providing you with daily, timely, and relevant content that will guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges. To find out how you can chart a course for the future which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side, visit our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, Your Indispensable Guide Through the Global Recession located at conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odland, and I'm joined today by Klaus Stavry, the senior economist at the Conference Board. So Klaus, before the break, we you, you know you were talking a little bit about productivity. Huh? That's a pretty important piece of when, when you're talking about growth for the, the differential between developed markets and emerging markets, because Product, you know, you talk a little bit about productivity, but basically, you know, th these drivers of automation and, um, you know, all the things that developed nations have invested in have have kind of been boiled through, and and that's, you know, that's in the growth rate. But emerging markets are just beginning to do that. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the key thing I think for what's driving emerging markets productivity growth is is you know simply as you say they're they're catching up to. Uh, uh, you know, technologies that uh, have been uh, developed initially in uh, in mature economies. So that's a, that's a key driving force uh, behind, you know, their uh, improvements in product. And, and what we mean by productivity is simply, you know, the ratio of uh, 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 output over inputs, right? So you're able to squeeze more output out of the same number of inputs. So this catch-up effect is a, is a big driver. But then again, uh, it's not... It's not a sort of automatic thing that you know what because you're simply because you're behind the curve you will automatically drive your productivity growth faster i mean that's it has been true for for a number of particularly asian economies uh, but also some african economies but they have other ones particularly in latin america where actually they you know they sort of stopped converging uh and basically you know from 1970s onwards so it's a, you know again it's on the one hand it's you know it's this kind of easy low hanging fruit kind of thing uh, in theory but in practice I mean it doesn't always you know uh, add up like an like an automatic uh, growth driver in that sense. You see more transfer of IP, uh, intellectual property, technology, automation. You know that that is coming from the developed nations, uh, and it's in it. You know if they can afford to invest, and if their labor costs are such that you know it, it makes sense to invest in these things then you can really get these these step ups in productivity mm -hmm. yeah yeah no that's 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 an excellent point yeah yeah now you you know the the other thing about emerging market economies is their vulnerability to global shocks talk about their resilience because you know we're in a period of time when you know recession particularly in developed nations is is a, a very worrisome factor yeah yeah. So um, indeed, as you mentioned, I mean, historically, especially, you know, if you look at the 1980s, when the Fed, uh, the US Federal Reserve raised rates very rapidly, you had uh, that, you know, that resulted in, in, in debt crisis across a lot of emerging economies you had. And just recently, I mean, about a decade ago, you had this uh, so-called taper tantrum. So overall, and that's, again, it's also one of the characteristics, I guess, of an emerging market economy is that it's more vulnerable to these global shocks because it's a bit more of a boom-bust kind of uh, um, uh, cycle that they, that they seem to be going through. But then, yeah, interestingly, this year, despite, you know, the shock of the, uh, again, the rapid uh, tightening uh, by U.S. monetary policy, we had the Ukraine war and, and you know, and all the impacts of that we had uh, much lower growth in china that's that's significant uh typically usually for for emerging market as a group as well 
but despite these shocks overall they've been quite resilient and i think that's that's a story that you don't hear a lot about uh, but it's it's worth telling yeah yeah you know there, in, in the past you know there's always been this this thing with the emerging markets you know for for instance brazil where you say it's the you know it's the market of the future and always will be <laughs> because every time you go into eternal promise yeah, yeah exactly and you know and as businesses invest there you know then you have the currency shocks and and devaluation so it's so but it it does seem that emerging markets are becoming more stable yeah. and, and you know that's important because you know our listeners are you know are, are making business investment decisions and and it, it's important to understand the underlying reasons. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned some of the currencies, but actually for this year, if you look at the euro or the, or the, the, the yen, the Japanese uh, currency, I mean, they've, they've performed much worse than, uh, than a lot of uh, emerging market currencies. Yeah. Now, inflation is, you know, is, is really been a, a huge issue. Talk about the differences that you're seeing globally with inflation and, and its potential threats to emerging markets. Yeah. So overall, yeah, inflation, as we have seen in, in the US and, and also in Europe, I mean, really shot up in a lot of emerging markets. This happened as well. Um, uh, and perhaps even in some even a bit more extreme. So just to give you, you know, the flavor of some of the numbers, I mean, it depends a bit on how you aggregate and everything. But overall, emerging market inflation is currently at around 10 to 11 percent year over year versus about what is it seven to eight percent in uh, in uh, in mature uh, markets and again you know these are very simple aggregates and this compares to you know two percent in no, uh, sort of in normal times in mature economies and about four percent normal times in, in emerging markets so yeah clearly there's been a an upsurge in inflation as well uh, but at the same time there's there's a large difference between emerging economies so you have some outliers like Argentina, but also Turkey, where, where inflation is, uh, at least official inflation, is, is above 80%. And in the case of Turkey, there have been a lot of concerns raised by, by various uh, researchers and analysts that actually the actual inflation is actually much higher, uh, perhaps even, even double that number. But, and then we have you know the, the Asian economies where inflation is typically a bit more moderate. I mean, it has also picked up there, but much less, uh, much less extreme. And then you know you have the Latin American economies that uh, have generally have seen more more intense inflation. Um, but you know just just as we saw in the U.S., it may be past this peak. For example, in Brazil, there's been a couple of months where inflation has been uh, has been declining. So Klaus, you know, as you look um, at in in the years ahead, which of these emerging markets are are you know looking pretty solid, and which ones are most at risk of recession? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean. We've talked about resilience and uh, uh, strength in overall, you know, emerging economies, but they're not out of the woods yet. I would say. I mean, uh, we have the uh, the slowdown in mature economies, and for sure, we're gonna see a, a pretty pretty significant slowdown in emerging markets too. I think the most vulnerable economies are uh, particularly in Latin America. I think um, where we had very rapid uh, monetary policy uh, tightening. So just think of the US, I think we had, what is it, three, 350 basis points over a couple of meetings. Uh, but compare that to Brazil or Chile, where they had over a, over a thousand basis points increase, uh, cumulative increase over the last, you know, a year or two. So that has to, that's, that's transmitting to the economy and that's likely going to cause, you know, a severe uh, slowdown, if not a recession there. Uh, we have the commodity price boom that is really, you know, uh, uh, slowing down. So that's, you know, that's another growth uh, uh, driver that is that is uh, going away. And I think, I think Turkey is also, uh, you know, a bit on the on the on the verge of of, of a recession or at least also a, a severe slowdown. We already had a negative GDP growth in Q3. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the 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 monetary policy that is uh, has been uh, uh, very accommodative, but at the same time very high inflation. So something we'll have to give at some point there. So, so I, yeah, if I have to single out a couple of countries, it's probably Turkey and a number of Latin American economies, including Brazil and, and Chile. And uh, yeah. Just to wrap up then, you know, as you, as you look at these forecasts and so forth, any other comments, any other points that uh, you want to make for our listeners on the emerging market outlook? Yeah. So we think overall that most 
as I said earlier, I mean, we, we do see a weakening ahead for emerging markets, but at the same time, we do think they will continue to outperform and the global economy. I think most of the strength is going to be in emerging Asian economies. So uh, particularly in, in China, as we'll see a, a bit of a rebound there next year, uh, but also other, other economies, India, uh, Indonesia. Again, we do see them slowing as well, especially if you know global goods demand, for example, is is slowing down. So that will be a drag for their for their economies. But overall, we still see you know more strength uh, and and much faster growth in these these economies compared to, for example, the U.S. or, or Europe. Klaus Debris, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts on the emerging market. My pleasure, Steve. It's good to be here. And thanks to all of you for listening into CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, ESG, human capital, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues and your friends. I know that everybody's going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, the indispensable ally that has helped businesses through war, recession, and economic transformation for over 100 years. As recent unexpected economic challenges persist, you can chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side. Just visit our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, your indispensable guide through the global recession located at www.conference-board.org slash topics slash recession.